The important point is to understand the techniques that are used to determine value. That's the key. There are different forms of value and in the first module, so week one, you won't see any calculations in this week's slides. Um, next week and the following week, we'll, we'll get into more of the calculations. First week is mainly introduction. So here we're looking at definitions. Okay, We're looking at the investment process. We're looking at this concept of value. So how do we establish value? How do we measure it? What is value? Does value have different, um, let's say, meaning or context? So when looking at intrinsic value, we're focusing on equity, which is shares. And we're applying these techniques to both foreign and domestic markets. Foreign would be international, domestic would be local. Okay, now we've got a note here about the actual topic being equity asset valuation. When looking at this word valuation, what comes to mind? The worth of something. Correct, worth. Good. So when looking at long-term performance, assets are going to have an underlying value. Underlying meaning we believe the asset is worth something. But can that value change? Um, yes, it can. Yes, it can. Can the value increase or decrease? It can increase or decrease, yes. Correct. Okay, both can happen uh, depending on the market. So what do we consider when determining value of an asset? If we talk very general, let's just say a value of as uh, an asset. Um, there's an example here which we'll discuss, but let's just discuss value in, in a general context. What will I consider? What type of asset it is? Um, what what do you use the asset for? Good. Anything I else? I see you got an example. Um, okay, that's perfect. Um, type is important yeah. because you're right. Different types of assets will have different values. Okay. Also, you said, how am I going to use it or what am I going to use it for? That's also important. So yes. use of the asset either makes the asset more or less valuable. Okay, so those are two really good examples when considering general value for a particular asset. So now if I focus specifically on a house, what would we use to value this asset? Uh, the size of the house, the land, the building... Um, how many rooms does it has? have, the square meterage, lots of things. <laughs> Correct, good. Okay, so do you agree when we actually focus on a specific asset, different assets will have different uh, factors to consider. So a house, yes. as you said, size is important for a house. Yes. Okay, but if we look at size in terms of technology, let's talk about a mobile phone in terms of value. Would you want a bigger or smaller mobile phone? A small phone. <laughs> yeah, you'd want it to be compact. Well, you wouldn't yes. want it to be too small that the screen size wouldn't be big enough to um, to use in terms of um, navigation and so on. But in terms of size, you're not going to want a phone that's the size of a laptop because that's not practical. You're not going to be able to carry that around in your pocket or, or, um, or purse, depending on the situation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so factors yes, are key. True. So when looking at the, um, the size and the meterage, okay, and um, how many rooms, how many facilities are there? Does it have a pool? Doesn't it have a pool? Um, do you agree they are qualitative and quantitative considerations that we would have to consider? Quantitative. Yes. Right, so if I'm looking at quantitative, what does that mean? Quantitative. Quantitative. The quality. Quanti okay, quality Quanti is qualitative. Yeah, so quality yes. Quality would be looking at things like number of, uh, or let's say um, qualitative would be the quality. So how, near, how near or far are we from certain resources? Okay. Okay, so um, in terms of property, if property is located near lots of, um, uh, how can I call it, public services. So, for example, yes. if it's near the mall, if it's near the police station, if it's near the fire station, if it's near schools, 
if it's near um, transport routes. Um, so when looking at qualitative, we're looking at factors that we can't really measure. You can't measure um, being close to a, a mall. You're either close to the mall, you're not. So qualitative is those other factors. Or something else that you could maybe measure qualitatively could be something like what sort of locate or where are you located? So are you located in a very cold area, right? Or are you located in a very warm area, depending on the climate? So climate is qua qualitative. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, quantitative is things we can measure. So that's size. Size we can measure. It'll either be maybe a thousand um, meters squared, perhaps, or, or, or greater, depending on how large the actual property is. So if we're looking at qu uh, quantitative, those are things we can measure. So like number of rooms would be something we can measure. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, the size of the property, that's something we can measure. All right, so factors can be qualitative and quantitative, but both are important for determining value. All right, so applying this to equity, where do we find value? Well, when looking at equity asset valuation, the focus is on shares. Okay, so we've got pictures here looking at finding value in the market. Right, so trying to do this, analyzing different assets and determining if they're over or undervalued. When would we want to purchase assets? When they are over or undervalued? Undervalued. Correct. Okay, so we're looking at buying things when they are cheap and selling them when they are expensive. So in order to do that, we need to find value and the market will present certain opportunities. Right, so what markets do we get? In um, INV2601, you spoke about different markets. Can you remember some of them? <laughs> my my, my um, brain is blank at the moment. <laughs> okay, don't worry. Um, let's look at the examples on the screen. Are these, what sort of markets are these then on the screen? Uh, I can see Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Yes. So New what York, type of market London. is the JSE? Is it primary or secondary? Or both. It's primary. Prim okay, it could be primary. If you say primary, what's the definition of a primary market? Primary is the first time we go to school. Okay, if, um, I'm taking out obviously preschool and that, but let's just say primary school is your first step in terms of education. So the JSC primary market would mean the first That's time you, you list. Sell on an exchange. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so okay. have you heard of the word IPO? Uh, no, not that I can remember. Okay, IPO stands for initial public offering. Okay. All right, so an initial public offering is when a company first lists on an exchange. So the JSE is a market. Okay, remember a market is a meeting place for buyers and sellers. So if we're looking to buy groceries, we go to the supermarket, okay, our local supermarket, and we purchase food and so on. If we're looking at buying financial products, okay, we go to the financial markets. And the JSC is a financial market because willing buyers and sellers meet at the JSC and exchange products. Okay, so we can exchange cash for products in terms of equity or bonds, depending on what we're buying. So an IPO, is when companies first list on an exchange. Okay, you're also doing the FIN modules. Um, you've done FIN 3701. So in that module, you spoke about raising capital either in the form of debt or equity in order to accept or reject certain projects. So if I'm looking at IPO, remember companies need to raise capital. So if they're raising capital and they're using equity, they're going to need to do that with the JSC. Okay, the JSC is going to be the intermediary Okay, obviously with assistance from the banks, and they'll then be able to raise capital. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yes. Okay, so that's one example. Others, New York Stock Exchange. Okay, that's yeah. obviously in America. Then we've got London, and then we've got Tokyo. Okay, so those are the three biggest exchanges in the world. Okay, London, Tokyo, and New York. Right, because you've got different time zones. Okay, so obviously in the east, we've got... Japan, okay, the, the um, Japan Stock Exchange. Okay, then we've got obviously in the middle, so central, 
we've got London, okay, similar time frame as Africa, and then you've got West, which is New York, America, and those are the big stock exchanges on the world in terms of markets, right? So a lot of volume is traded on those markets in terms of equity, okay, buying and selling those assets. South Africa, we've got the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, okay? Mm. Johannesburg Stock Exchange was created in 1887, okay? So that's 137 years old this year. So 137 wow. years is not that old. Some of our companies are even older than that. So in terms of the market, when looking at the JSC, uh, we're looking at a relatively young exchange. Okay, the JSC, well, 130 years does sound quite old, okay? But in the broader context, it's still quite a, a young um, exchange compared to other more developed markets, okay, like London, like New York, like Japan, okay. So when looking at being an analyst, what did we say we're trying to find? Over Hello? undervalued assets. Yeah. Undervalued. Undervalued, correct. Okay, we want undervalued assets because the only way you're going to make a profit is by selling undervalued assets at a higher price. So we don't buy when the market is bullish because then the market is expensive. We normally buy when the market is bearish, okay, because we're hoping for the market to turn and then we'll, we'll generate a profit because we're investing in equity. Okay, so that's the outline, okay, we're looking at markets, we're looking at shares. In terms of your pre-reading, um, the textbook is very, very, very good in terms of theory, and it's quite long as well. Um, each chapter is around 100, 200 pages, depending on uh, which topic you're reading about. Um, so if you can, try to do some pre-reading before class if you, if you, if you, um, if you have some time. Um, and then obviously okay. make some notes on the slides that you've got. This is a very practical subject, so um, you'll see with, with all subjects at a third year level, um, it tends to be more practical because now we're applying the theory as well. Um, and from an exam point of view, um, your exam for this module is half multiple choice and half long questions. And we have seen long questions before which are in an essay type of format. Um, so you are going to have to write about a particular topic. Um, so I've seen questions before where they've asked you about the, the investment process. That's something that is covered in the first week's notes. And there mm -hmm. has been a long 10 mark question in an in a old past paper. Um, so mm -hmm. you do need to be quite practical um, in terms of your application of the theory. So knowing the theory is important, um, but then you need to apply it as well to the scenario. So UNISA will give you a case study and then they'll ask you a 10 mark question um, regarding the investment process. And then we're going to have to apply the theory. And that's where application comes into it. Okay, but we'll look at past papers later. So um, don't worry too much about that now. But just bear in mind that you do have long questions and short questions. Um, for this module. All right, so if you have any questions, stop me during class and ask, um, and we can we can address it. Okay, any questions so far? No, no, no questions. Okay, all right, so study unit one is focusing on this, the process. What is a process, Melanie? Uh, a process is a series of events. Good. Okay, so in terms of a step-by-step -step process that we need to consider, why does equity valuation need the step-by-step -step process? Mm -hmm. How we, or why is the process important? Why, why do we need to apply a process to choosing equity? Uh, I think uh, it's important to make sure that we've covered all our bases. Good. Okay, remember earlier when we spoke about the house example, I mean, there's so many different yes. considerations for buying a house. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we could talk about, as you said, space, size, um, facilities and so on, but you could also talk about other things as well. Um, so when looking at equity, there's so much, it's so broad. So as you said, we need to make sure we cover everything. So if there's a process, we know we've covered and we've ticked all the boxes. If we've ticked all the boxes and we're happy with that investment, then we're going to invest. Because remember, we're managing investments, okay? Equity, asset valuation, investment management. So the investment management is what we're focusing on. How do we manage our portfolio? If we're looking at equity, there's going to be a process that we need to follow. 
Right, so these are some of the outcomes that we'll be looking at. From a study unit one point of view, um, what is important in terms of exams, they do test the valuation models quite often. They ask you what's the difference between an absolute valuation model versus a relative. Okay, those are theory questions. Um, the theory is important because that comes up in the short questions, multiple choice, and then in the longer questions, they talk about the steps, the objectives, the tasks, and they expand on the process. All right, so those two are important. The models, there's different models. We'll discuss what they are later, and then we'll also look at the process. So what steps do I need to take in order to get to the end result? The end result is to make a decision. Are we going to buy or sell a particular asset? There's two different approaches. You, you probably recognize these from the first module, 2601. In 2601, you spoke about top-down, bottom-up approaches. Does that ring a bell? Yes, it does. Okay, so you can either look broad and then magnify the glass onto a specific company, or you can start with a company and then go broad. Okay, so top-down or bottom-up, depending on where we're starting. Right, there's no about quantitative and qualitative. Okay, quantitative, looking at things we can measure based on numbers. Qualitative, things we can't measure, right, but things we need to consider. Okay, okay, then we've got HPR again, we've got alpha, fair value. These are all concepts we've spoken about in the previous model, uh, 2601, uh, covering in I and V. Okay, uh, we'll recap that. There is a nice revision chapter in the textbook um, that we have for this third year module, and then we'll revise all those concepts, so, um, just to make sure you haven't forgotten any of the basics from 2601. Then we've also, uh, also got the role. Okay, so a role would be the responsibilities. What are they actually going to be doing? What will an analyst have to do in order to make a decision on whether to buy or sell a particular asset? Okay, so Melanie, I've got three questions here for you to, to answer. The first one is, okay. what is value? So what do you think value is? Um, the worth of an asset. Okay. In terms of the worth, how do we measure the value then? Um, like we've said in the beginning, uh, we need to know what type of asset it is and what it can be used for and what value would it bring to us. Okay, so is value measurable? Is it quantifiable? I, I think it can. Yes, it is. Okay, yes, it is. So when looking at equity asset valuation, how are we going to measure value of equity? Mm. We're going to look at the price. Yes. Okay, so the rands and cents. Okay, because in, yeah. in terms of measuring value, the only way we can measure value is by assigning a price okay, or a, um, mm -hmm. a cost to that particular asset. Okay. Okay. So how are we going to measure or value financial assets? Mm. Can we compare assets? Is that a way to measure it? If they're similar, I would say yes. Okay, good. So yes, if they're similar, we can compare them. But if they're very different, we, we won't be able to because we need to compare apples with apples. Okay, good. Yeah. Right, so if we're looking at how would we value those assets, one method of valuation could be a comparison. Okay, so this is leading on to absolute and relative valuation models. Okay, and even market valuation. Okay, so where we're actually looking mm -hmm. at the market and determining what the actual value is. Okay, a market-based approach. Okay, so maybe just to write those words down, absolute, okay. relative, and then like a market-based approach. Okay, all of these measures uh, or measurement criteria in terms of absolute measures or relative measures or market-based measures um, are broken up into specific topics. So, for example, we'll learn about dividend discounting again. We'll recap that, and then we'll we'll group it under one of them. Okay, absolute, relative, or market base. Okay, and then we'll learn about other measures. Uh, measures. So, like free cash flow, and then we'll group it under absolute, relative, or market base. 
and then we'll learn about something like PE okay. ratios. Okay, and a PE ratio would be also classified under absolute relative or market based. Okay, so those are the three main ways of or methods or methodologies. Okay, those are three methodologies that we could apply when valuing financial assets. Okay, absolute relative or market based. Right, so here's the definition that the textbook gives you talking about valuation. What is valuation? It's the estimation of an asset's value based on variables. Okay, that's a key word because a variable is a factor to consider. They can be qualitative or quantitative, okay? It's just a variable, mm -hmm. something we can or can't measure. Right, perceived to be related to future investment returns. Okay, so notice we're not only looking at now, we're not only looking at today. So earlier we spoke about buying a house. Right, yes. do we only consider buying the house based on today's factors? So today's factors I mean in terms of um, where the current place is in terms of location or do we think about the future we always think about the future <laughs> correct okay so um, um ha have you have you bought um uh, okay uh, are you are you renting or are you or did you buy property oh uh, we're renting at the moment we're actually in the market for buying okay so you guys are renting currently so what sort of location are you guys situated uh, uh, is it um uh, i know like uh, like the belito bella uh, uh, yeah belito uh, what's the other um, uh, down there by the uh, what, what are they called Zimbali Lodge? Yes. Is it uh, is it sort of in that vicinity? It's a it's a nice holiday destination. No. Yeah, but we in the bluff. We more south. Okay, more south. South coast. Yes. Okay, so more south coast. Okay, so if you guys are more south yes. compared to more north, um, do you yeah. agree? Uh, okay, let's talk about future investment returns. So in okay. Durban, okay, which area is more developed, the north or the south? Um, I would say the south now, but the north is developing slowly. Okay, so, so the, place the south to be... is, okay, sorry, uh, hmm. just complete that sentence. I, I, I interrupted, yeah? Yes, so I think, but the place to be is the north because it's coming, it's booming really fast over the last couple of years. All right. Okay, good. So do you see you're thinking about future as well? So, yeah. um, so based on your observation, okay, because uh, you've obviously got a much better view on the current situation in, in Durban um, because you're living and you're working in that particular location. So you become an expert or an analyst in that particular area. That's why in investments, you get all sorts of analysts. You get analysts that that focus on a particular type of industry or market. So if we're focusing on your example here about property, you, you've you identified an opportunity for growth in the north compared to the south. The south currently, yeah. as you said, is slightly more developed, but the north is really booming and growing quite quickly. So from an investment management point of view, you could maybe take that as a variable, see a perceived variable. All right, you might or might yes. not be right, but that's not the that's not the point. The point is you have you have variables that you've identified and you've perceived the north to be better in terms of future investment return. So purchasing property in the north might be a better long-term decision rather than purchasing property let's say in the south. True. Okay. So that's valuation. And we're going to be doing the exact same thing, but we're going to be relating it to equity. So why should we buy company A compared to company B? What points do we have for A and against A that'll make us choose B? All right, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to compare similar assets. Okay, so if we go back to the house example, we're not going to be comparing an apartment to a house, or we're not going to compare a house to a a mansion okay we're going to be comparing similar assets so if we're looking at houses we're looking at similar houses so if it's two three bedroom houses we're going to be looking at those and we're going to be comparing those and we're also going to be looking at which are um, or not which when in terms of relevant okay so or when relevant on estimates of immediate liquidation proceeds so what does it mean to liquidate something Terminate something. Yes, to end. Okay, to terminate 
So to basically sell. So if you're being liquidated, you're selling everything. All right. So again, with valuation, we need to weigh up the the future investment return in terms of what could we immediately get if we had to liquidate. Okay, in terms of the proceeds. So we're estimating. All right. So if we estimate, we're saying, well, I believe we could sell that property in that location for a specific amount. Right. Our valuation is going to be based on what we think the future investment return is going to be for that asset compared to what it currently is worth today. Okay, so w with value, value is very subjective. Okay, that's a point that I want to raise here in terms of subjectivity. Okay, if something is subjective, what does that mean? Mm. Any idea? It can have many meanings, I'm not sure. All right, so... Just guessing. Bias. What does it mean to be biased? Biased. Uh, when you're, you're not objective. biased towards something, what does that mean? You're not being objective. Okay, good. Being. You're not being objective. Great. So, objective, objectivity is the uh, opposite of subjectivity. So, um, which is better, to be objective or to be subjective? I would say objective. Good. Okay, you should be objective, meaning you should be unbiased. You shouldn't like something just because you like something. And that's where mm -hmm. value comes in, in terms of this whole idea of different contexts. Okay, so if there's context, right, we need to understand that context because we may or may not make good decisions in that situation. Because you might do something because you like it, or you might do something because you love it. Okay, so let's think about this. Um, did you grow up in the South or the North? The North. <laughs> you grew up in the North. So maybe you're yes. a little bit subjective in terms of your bias towards the North versus the South because you grew <laughs> up there. That's context. So for you, in terms of value, um, the North is yes. closer to your heart than the South is because there's different contexts possibly <laughs> okay so that's what we need to look at from an investment point of view because when it comes to investments we're dealing with rands and cents should we be, mm -hmm. should we be making decisions based on what i like or what i love no we shouldn't no eh? we shouldn't okay we shouldn't be buying company a just because we like the company and then sure. when we look at the financial statements the company is doing terribly but we like the company so we're still going to invest that that's a bad way of investing we should try eliminate bias and we should be objective. All right, mm -hmm. so let's have a look at the first definition. There's a few here. Okay, so I'm going to cover the definitions, right? And then afterwards we'll see mm -hmm. um, there's a few things to consider as well, but we need to first understand this whole concept of value. So I started off by asking you generally what value is. Okay, so you, you define it as being worth. Okay, so now we know. We, we're trying to work out what is something worth to us as the investor. But this word value can be broken up into different, let's say, topics. Or, or, or um, there can be different words to define it. So the first is intrinsic value. Okay, so the definition for intrinsic value is any asset. Um, okay, intrinsic value of any asset is the value of the given asset given a hypothetically complete understanding of the asset investment characteristics. Right, and the way I like to view this is, is this, the real or the true value. Okay, so intrinsic value is the important one because I am looking at everything possibly. Okay, so everything possible that I can consider, be it um, things I can measure, things that I can't measure, be it things that I, I like in terms of my bias or things that I don't, um, let's say, I don't, I view objectively, okay, so we are, I don't have any bias towards, okay, so when looking at true or real value, you're actually looking at like fundamentally, what is it worth to you, okay, so the best way I can explain this is luxury vehicles, okay, so think about those sports cars, okay, so there's a picture here of a Ferrari, okay, Yes. Do you like sports cars? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, which is your favorite? 
Um, I would say the Ferraris. <laughs> okay, so you're you're a Ferrari fan. So Ferrari is obviously an Italian car. Okay, and mm. some people just love Italian cars because they're a fan of that particular make and model. Okay, so when we're looking at intrinsic value, we're taking everything into consideration. So why is Ferrari so popular? Um, they look good, they race cars. Okay, all right, so um, the, the aesthetics, how it looks, but do you agree it's also that history, that story? Okay, that, that yes. legacy. I mean, Ferrari's got a long track record, do you agree? Enzo Ferrari That's created this brand and it has just gone bigger and bigger and bigger in terms of being a, um, a supercar make and model. That's true. Okay, so in terms of true and real value, do you agree we're looking at everything? We're looking at the company culture, we're looking at the history, we're looking maybe at the passion. Okay, people are very passionate about cars. So. Yes. Italians could be very passionate about their own brand of car. So Italians may only purchase Ferrari because of that um, that that culture, that that heritage. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um that it's it, it's that it's, it's it's everything. So the point I'm trying to make is when you're looking at intrinsic value, you're taking literally everything into consideration. Your emotions towards that asset, the history, the culture, even the management who's running the company maybe you could you could even talk about who's designing the cars all right you might like that particular product because of the designer all right so it all depends but intrinsic True. value is taking everything it's a it's a hypothetically complete understanding see that's the key word there hypothetical meaning it's impossible to completely understand every characteristic or factor that goes into your asset's value. But hypothetically, if we could consider everything, that's what we've got <laughs> here in terms of intrinsic value. The intrinsic value is literally everything. Everything that we can see, we can measure, we can, um, uh, we can interpret, that's what we're gonna be looking at here in terms of intrinsic value. Okay. All right, so then just a note at the bottom, Analysts often view market prices with both skepticism or respect and skepticism. All right, so if we look at equity, okay, no more cars now, we look at the equity, okay? So if I'm looking at shares, why do okay. markets view, uh, not markets, why do analysts view the market with respect and skepticism? Any idea? No. Okay, because of fear, and greed <laughs> okay so we're looking at investing do you agree yes so what is investing all about um, define investments for me in in one in one sentence i would say in one sentence or one word a sentence or a word okay, okay. i would say growth okay growth okay Debate. good so yeah so that's that's good. So in terms of investments, we want to make more in the future than we currently have. So growth, perfect. So if I'm looking at the market, do you agree when the market's greedy, are the prices going to be very high, very low? No. <laughs> low? Yes. Why do you say low? Um, people want to buy more, they get greedy. Okay, so what happens if people want to buy more? Do the prices stay the same? No, then they go up. <laughs> okay, they go up. So supply and demand. Okay, so when the market is greedy, okay, so when things are good, the prices of those assets are very high. Okay, so I don't know what the current property uh, market is like in Durban at the moment. Okay, but obviously you'd be wanting to buy when people are not greedy, when people are fearful. Because if everyone's scared right, of buying houses, are the prices gonna be very high, very low? If they're scared, it's gonna be very high. No, it's, if they're scared to buy, no one's buying. So if no one's buying, what, 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 what's gonna happen to the prices? It'll be low. <laughs> Correct, the prices are gonna fall. Okay, so when, when people are scared, they're, they're not willing to buy goods. 
Okay, if there aren't any buyers in the market, the prices of those goods and services are going to fall because you need to try attract the buyers, right? And that's why mm -hmm. analysts view the market with skepticism and respect because with when we, we respect the market because the prices that we see in the market are what we see in the market, but we'll never ever know for sure if those prices are actually true in terms of intrinsic value okay so true or real okay so that's why we always need to have some skepticism because you might be thinking you're buying something at a discount but maybe in the future the price actually falls and that's why we need to be mindful of is the market fearful or is the market greedy true <laughs> okay all right, so here's a note about intrinsic value and how does it relate to the market? Well, the word here is alpha. Okay, you've, you've probably seen alpha before when you looked at the Jensen measure in 2601. Jensen yes. measure, okay, E-N, okay, Jensen measure. With the Jensen measure, they spoke about alpha return. What is alpha? It's just the abnormal return. Okay, the, the, the best way I can explain this to you in terms of alpha um, is a discount. Okay, buying things at a discount, right, and making making a profit because you've bought something on sale. Okay, it's almost like a sale, if you will, okay, as an example. Okay. All right, so let's think about this. Um, have you ever bought something on sale? Yes. Okay, <laughs> and why did you buy it on sale? Uh, you'd rather buy it on sale than when it's on, at its original price. Okay, so buying it at its original price would have been more than buying it at a discount, right? Yes. Okay, so do you agree? Let's say, okay, so um, give me an example of a product that you've bought recently. Mm, clothing. Clothing. Okay, perfect. All right, so, uh, okay, give me an item of clothing so we can be more specific. A dress. A dress. Okay, so... Let's say you bought a dress. How much did the dress cost? Um, it was 250 Okay, 250 all right. And that was from one store. So let's say you, yes. you, you bought the dress and was this dress at a discount, a sale? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so this dress was bought at 250 from Shop A. But then mm -hmm. you knew that Shop B was selling the exact same dress for 500 so what could you do to generate an abnormal return? Well, you could buy the dress for 250 from the one store and you could mm -hmm. go to the other store and sell it to that store at 300 or 400 and you would still make an, a profit, do you agree? Yes. Okay, so an abnormal return is making a profit based on the mispricing of a particular asset. Okay, mispricing mm -hmm is when I can buy something somewhere at one price and then sell it immediately somewhere else for another price. Okay. Okay, that's mispricing. It's also called arbitrage. Okay, so I'm going <laughs> to write that word down. R A Okay. Uh let's wrap that out. Okay, arbitrage. Okay, arbitrage is looking at mispricing. Okay, being able to buy something now at one price and sell it somewhere else at the exact same price. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's looking at so so another example. It, this is a good example. Okay, you're in you're in Durban. I'm in Joburg. Okay. So, um, when you go to the coast, petrol is slightly cheaper, right, compared to the mm -hmm. inland towns. Yes. Okay. So in Joburg, you pay slightly more for petrol than you do at the coast. Yes, that's true. Why is that? It's because obviously um, all the oil that gets that gets imported comes through the harbors, and that's why, um, in terms of the supply chain, petrol doesn't mm -hmm. have to travel as far to reach the consumer. So in Joburg, we've got to pay for the transport to get the petrol from the coast back up to Joburg. <laughs> Do you agree? Yes. Okay, so let's let's assume that Melanie. Let's assume that. Um, okay, so we're talking via Skype. Let's assume that Skype had, um, a, a let's say Skype had a feature, so Melanie mm -hmm. could take petrol and put it in a, a petrol container, and you could send it to me immediately. 
okay, through Skype, and I would receive that can of petrol. Would we be able to run a profitable business? I'm sure we would. Hey? We would, because it's not going to cost us anything. I could ask no. Melanie, will Melanie give me 100 kiloliters of petrol so I can sell it in Joburg, and we'll make instant profit because it's cheaper in Durban than it is in Joburg, and that would be arbitrage. We're, we're making an abnormal... We're making an abnormal return based on the mispricing of those assets. Okay. okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. All right, good. There is an equation here that talks about estimated value. So obviously, estimated value minus the market price will be equal to okay, the intrinsic value minus the market price plus the estimated value minus the intrinsic value. It's just a formula. I haven't seen them use this formula yet. In past papers, they use other equations. Okay, maybe just a note about equations. Are you going to have to learn all these formulas? Yes, I'm sure I have to. <laughs> no, you don't, Melanie. Some good news to share with you. You don't have to Seriously? learn any of these <laughs> equations. Do you know why? Why? They give you a formula sheet in the exam. My word. <laughs> okay. That's good news. <laughs> all right, so you need to know how to use the equations. because. Use them. By the time we get to the end of the last chapter, you've got literally like five pages of equations. That's how many there are. There's a lot. Okay. So it's impossible for you, Nisa, to ask you to memorize all those equations because that's not very fair on the student because it's just too many to remember. All right. So fortunately, we don't need to remember any of them. We just need to recognize them and we need to know when to use the right equation. That's all. That's the, that's, the trick to, that's the trick to success in this module. Knowing what equation to use when, because the equations are there in the exam. You just need to know which one do I use. Okay. All right. Okay, then here's a note about intrinsic value. Okay. We spoke about it. We spoke about alpha. Now I'm looking at an example. Okay, so the example I've got here is looking at active investors. Okay, they're looking for a corporate event or they're looking for a particular market event. All right, so that, that's called a catalyst. Okay, you might have seen the word catalyst before in, in other modules, okay, but I'm going to give it context in this one. A catalyst is something you look for that's going to cause the marketplace to reevaluate the company's prospects, okay, meaning it's going to change the value of that company. Right, so if something happens in the market, it's going to affect the company, so, so affect the investment. Right, so there's a picture here of some chess pieces. Right, have you ever played mm -hmm. chess before? No, I haven't. You haven't. Okay, do you know how to play chess though? No. Okay, you don't. Okay, um, do you know what the game is focusing on? I only know the word checkmate. <laughs> okay, all right, so checkmate is the word that you shout out when you actually win because this is a game of strategy. Okay. Okay, so it's a game of strategy. It's 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 trying to outsmart your opponent uh, because each piece on the ch uh, chessboard has a specific mm -hmm. um, role. Okay, so they all all the pieces move differently, and you need to try trap the king. Okay, the king is what you're trying to to trap. Okay, but um, that aside. Okay, that's just a side note about chess. But the focus in the game is about strategy, and when it comes to this catalyst and this value we need to focus on strategy so what do you think is going to happen in the market okay so february is a very important month in south africa why um, it's is it the end of the financial year or something okay that's a good point so it's it's the end of the tax year for individuals tax. yes um but Relating to tax, what happens at the end of the month? Uh, company, you tax return. Uh, almost. The budget yeah. speech. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. How could I forget that? Yeah. All right. So every year in Feb, we have the budget speech. And that's the most important catalyst because the budget speech tells you everything that the government is planning to do going forward. How much they're going to spend, where they're going to spend it, are taxes going to stay the same, are the taxes going to change, are the taxes are going to go, are the tax, ta are the taxes going to go up, or are the taxes going to 
stay the same or go down. So the budget speech acts as a catalyst. Okay, so if the budget speech is very aggressive in terms of trying to collect more tax and they're raising taxes for everyone, do you think that'll help or harm the economy? It'll help the economy if taxes go up. Help the economy? So we should tax people more? Um, I think so. <laughs> Okay, it's going to help the government. It's not going to help the people if we're all going to have to pay more taxes. No, it won't help the people, yeah. Okay, so so that could be a catalyst. So depending on what happens in the actual budget speech, that will affect the market. And that's why we need to strategize. Okay, there needs to be a strategy. Okay, so we need to have a view on what is going to happen. And if that view is correct, then great, we can profit. If that view isn't correct then we need to change our plan. Okay. okay. Now the value here, we've got going concern and liquidation. Okay, there's two here. What impact will the following considerations have on value? So if I talk about going concern, what does that mean? Going concern from, um, from accounting? Accounting, yeah. I can't remember. I've, okay. I've seen it before though. Okay, yeah. Going concern means the company will continue to operate. Okay. Liquidation means it's going to close its doors and stop operating. Okay, that's the difference between going concern. So going concern means the business will continue and liquidation means the business will end. All right, so does that affect value? Yes. Definitely good. Okay, so when looking at this, the company will continue to operate in the foreseeable future. Which definition is that for? Uh, going concern. Good. And if it's going to be dissolved? Liquidation. Liquidation. Great. So when looking at that, again, if I'm looking at value, I need to look at both going concern and liquidation. Because here's an example. Okay, so... Um, let's talk about the car that you're driving. Okay, so obviously you're driving a vehicle. That vehicle, is that vehicle worth more than uh, worth more to you when it's you when it's used or when it's sitting in the garage? When it's being used. When it's being used. Okay, so now what happens if the vehicle gets broken down? It's of no use to me. <laughs> exactly. Okay, because now there isn't a going concern. So so a vehicle, a vehicle that's damaged, that cannot be used, doesn't have a going concern value compared to liquidation. Liquidation is what I can scrap the vehicle at. That's the scrap value. So if I take that vehicle and I trade in the old car for metal and glass and, and all the other stuff that you can get for it, okay, that's the scrap value. That's liquidation value. But a vehicle that's still going, that can still drive from A to B, has additional value because it has a going concern. Is that okay? Yes, yes. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. So things that are going to continue to operate are worth more than things that aren't operating. And the reason for that is the one generates income and the other doesn't. Okay, mm -hmm. so... If you have items that are that are that aren't doing anything, okay. So, for example, um, how many cell phones do you need? Just one. Yeah, one is more than enough. Okay, so one yep. good cell phone can do everything. You don't need multiple cell. So, so for example, you don't have one cell phone to only take photos. You don't have one cell phone to only make calls, and you don't have one cell phone to only surf the internet, right? You have, one, yes. you have one that does all three. That's right. Okay. So when look at going concern, going concern means um, the asset must be, we must be able to use that asset or continue to use it. If something can be continued to be used, it will be perceived as being worth more than an asset that isn't going to be used, which is going to be liquidated and sold. All right. That's the key differentiation between going concern and liquidation. One you can, use, you can use, and one, it's going to be dissolved. Right, so a company that's going to be bankrupt and going to be liquidated will be worth a lot less than a company that's continuing to operate. Okay. okay. 
okay. given you some pros and cons here. We spoke about this, continuing to sell goods and services. Okay, remember, what are we looking at? We're looking at equity. Okay, equity is mm -hmm. shares. So we're buying <laughs> shares in companies. If I'm buying shares in companies, I want those companies to sell goods and services. If the company is selling goods and services, that's a good company. Okay. Right, if they're utilizing assets, that's a good company. If they're optimizing their sources of financing, that's a good company. Right, if those assets are not going to be utilized, that's bad. Because those are assets that are just sitting around and doing nothing. Assets that aren't being used are actually worthless because they're not generating income. Then the utility is forgone, for okay, and only the bare assets are considered. Right, remember in economics they talk about utility, utility that benefit you get from using something. So if you can't use something, that's no longer part of the equation, and you can only sell it for what it is. Right, that's basically what we said earlier. A vehicle mm -hmm. that has been in, let's say, in a car accident that cannot move, okay, it's, it's idle, it's stationary, it needs to be written off. Okay, that's the bare asset. So writing off a bare asset would be the scrap value versus if the car could still run, and you'd be able to get something more for it. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll take a break shortly. I'm just gonna finish this last bit and then we'll take a quick yeah. break. Uh, we can grab a cup of coffee and then come back in and, and wrap up with the last bit, okay? Okay. All right, so here we've got a note about fair value and investment value. They're very similar. When you talk about fair value, fair means willing buyer and willing seller. Okay, remember, you can't force someone to buy and you can't force someone to sell. You need a willing buyer and willing seller to agree. Okay, that's the key word. They need to agree okay. on the price. Okay, and the agree, agreed price, the agreed price is what we've actually got as the fair value. Investment value is if you take it and you then use it to build certain synergy. Okay, what does the word synergy mean? I'm not sure. Okay, so um, here's an example. All right, so let's talk about tires, car tires. Okay, and the actual car. Okay, sorry, the artwork isn't so great, <laughs> okay, but I'll try my best, okay, so, okay, so, in terms of the car, alright, so, is the car valuable without tires? It has value, but it's not valuable. <laughs> okay, it's not as valuable if it didn't yeah. have tires. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, you need the tires for the vehicle in order to run. So investment value would be those synergies, okay? Because do you agree, I can sell tires separately from the car? Yes. Okay, but if I sell the car with the tires, there's synergy because now it becomes a more valuable asset. More valuable, yes. Okay, so that's investment value. Investment value is, is taking something from someone in terms of a purchase. Buying, someone, buying something from someone and being able to convert that into something else or or, or deriving some sort of synergy, so being able to use it for something more than what the actual asset is worth. Okay. Okay, so investment is looking at that future return, synergy. Okay, taking something that I can, that I can use in combination with something else that's going to yield a much bigger return. Okay. All right, so here's the last slide, then we'll take the break. So, Melanie, what can you conclude? Do you value valuations? Yes. <laughs> Why? Um, I think it's important uh, to take all these different um, concepts into consideration when you're valuing an asset or anything for nice. that matter, okay. any asset. Perfect. And um, is valuating assets very easy or difficult? I think it depends on the type of asset. <laughs> Correct. It does depend on the type of asset. Good. So yeah. valuations can be either very simple or very complex in, in terms of getting the actual value. Um, and there's a lot of things to consider. 